At long last, I'm getting to a treatment of this classic, classic sci-fi tactical game. This is actually the second video that I've made about it. The first one never made it beyond my computer due to various problems. And it took me a while to muster the energy to get back to it, but I really have to do it because it is an absolute classic game of man versus alien, really, not so much monsters per se, I would say at least, interstellar warfare in the 22nd century. Again, not actually interstellar. This is a tactical game and it is confrontational on one particular planet. And it is based very, very clearly on the classic Starship Troopers novel by Robert Heinlein. And in fact, the entire back of the box is really um, not so much about the game per se. Well, it is about the game, but it's from Robert Heinlein. And it is, um, here's what the author Robert Heinlein says about the game, not the author of the game, but the author of the book. This is to my knowledge anyway, one of the most explicitly uh, literary based games that I've ever seen, at least in the war game genre. And it is described here what it is based on um, in the context of the novel. And just read a little here of what is said on the back of the box. This game is based on the military axiom that final victory depends on the willingness of brave men to stand and fight and hold or die trying despite all fancy technology, all super weapons. Of course, that's pretty funny because there's a lot of fancy technology and super weapons here that are just abstracted, but in any event, he goes on to say, unlike most war games, Star Starship Troopers is laid many years in the future. Some planets unknown today are the war theaters for this game. The playing units of the Turan Federation, they're known as the Mobile Infantry, are an elite corps akin to the U.S. Marine Corps or U.S. Army paratroopers. The MI humans wear power jumpsuits that enable them to leap over obstructions such as buildings. That, by the way, is a very convenient mechanic, which I'll talk about when I get to the rules overview. Uh, talks about that they never leave men behind, and indeed there are retrieval boats that are played in the game. The MIs, the mobile infantry, are versatile. They can make a quick strike, do enormous damage in a few minutes, and return to their starship, or stay down for the full battle and conquer or die. And this does reflect the variety of scenarios that come with the books. Or excuse me, <laughs> see, it's really book oriented with the game. The enemies are non human aliens. One sort are the arachnids, something like giant spiders, who live a communal life and have a social structure resembling an ant or bee colony. And indeed, they are meant to be underground, and this is a sort of three dimensional map in the game. And the other type of enemy are the skinnies, a humanoid race that fights the Turan Federation early in the war. At a later phase, they are allied with the humans to fight the arachnids. And finally, Heinlein goes on to say, let your imagination range as widely as possible. There are no precedents for such battles. Well, I've taken the last sentences to heart because as you'll see, and if you're familiar with my channel, you know, I do a bit of a hybrid in terms of the scenario and the rules. And that's what we're going to take a look at here. I mentioned that this is very, very based on and tied to the novel and indeed the first page of the rules of play give you the backstory of the novel because I think it's not essential to have read the novel to enjoy and play this game but it does add a lot and it gives a context for the various scenarios but they provide you with some material here and I've been reading sort of contemporaneous to the publication of this game there were many things published in the general about it and there was some discussion about why Avalon Hill didn't just include a copy of the novel with the game itself. I mean, that's how tied it is, but for cost reasons, that wasn't done. So they do give you at least some basic background here. And they discuss the basic components. There are, I think it's 400 counters. There are a lot of counters in this game. And I'll just show you here the counter tray. You're really not using a lot of them. There's a lot of markers here for um, uh, combat outcomes. And they give you many more counters than you would necessarily use, even in the advanced scenarios. But it can be a little daunting to sort through them. And they are also labeled and um, you can see here that letter coming in. 
I guess I've got it upside down, the E value there, and all of the squads are labeled with letters and numbers here. And these do come into play because this is very unit based and you've got a control pad. Well, I don't have it here. I'll show you the back. Here's your um, control sheet. Now this is not one that I filled out. I guess I didn't bring the one I filled out with me to where I'm filming. Um, but this is man to man and you're keeping track of your men depending on the squad that you're using. I think in the demonstration I'm showing I'm using squads A and D. I tend to uh, take values that are not close together so that I don't get them confused. But um, you it does matter whether you're dealing with you know D1 guy or A3 guy and so those values are on the counters the um, we'll get to this other side here in a moment moving back to the counters um, th that said they're pretty basic war game standard war game values here we have our attack strength our defense our movement and here we do the number or the letter for the parent unit what they call and uh, the picture is the unit type and then there's an ID number for the actual counter itself and so this would look something like this here is um, what it actually comes in looking like. The other side, there are two types of alien units that you're facing. You've got your humanoids here, and they have warriors and workers and heavy weapons, ranged weapons, and they are represented in yellow. And the nicely uh, done for visual interest is the heavy weapons or the ranged weapons have red um, numbering and lettering on them so at a glance on the map you can easily figure out what is going to be a ranged weapon and then for the um the, the arachnids coming in are in red. So you're fighting against the yellow and the red counters and you yourself are the blue counters. Here's our basic uh, marauder and uh, this is one of the commanders that you have. Additional two things really give this game interest beyond a basic I fight you, you fight me situation. And the first of them is this um, special weapons and equipment. As the scenarios progress, the they get more complicated and I mentioned it's programmed instruction so the first basic scenario setup introduces um, essentially just movement and close combat which is hex based, you know, on the same hex combat. And it introduces strong points in the game, which give the opposition, the aliens, a uh, defense value of nine if they are inside them. And it will introduce some of the inverted and decoy counters. Now, this is a nice thing for the solo player because based in the game itself there are a number of counters that will have this decoy on the back or an inverted star on the back and you can mix them up yourself using some of the built-in decoys that are here and I'm doing this in the scenario that I have, so that you yourself can provide a situation where you're not sure what hex, what is in the hex that you're attempting to occupy, and that gives some fog of war naturally built in. So that is introduced in the first scenario as well, and we will get to the control sheet in more detail when we look at what we're actually doing here. More special weapons come in in the further scenarios. One of the, the second point that's of interest in this game is that the arachnids live underground and in the two-player version of the game the player that is playing that side is mapping out the tunnel structure, the underground tunnel structure that they 
are living within and this is a duplicate of the actual map and it down to the markings of you could so so small but the markings of the individual hexide names or numbers so that the uh, there's completely a duplicate underneath the map of a structure and the rules give you pretty specific instructions it's actually not that complicated um, each hive what um, is in each hive and how each hex has I think this is a 10 let's see I don't know where it says I think this is 10 hexes out and then you can off of that have one five hex length tunnel and up to two three hex length tunnels however you want um, but this is all meant to be done in secret so the second player has this mapped out and then there is a mechanism in the game for the Turan player to try to locate these tunnels and eventually either blow them up or go into them and destroy them etc. We'll get to how this works out in the solo system later on but um, that is you know, it's an interesting fact of the game because it gives a dimensionality to it. And alongside of that are necessary special weapons and equipment to breach the tunnel, to try to find the tunnel with certain listening devices, and also to to seal off the tunnel. And there are combat engineers that can seal off the tunnel. We will be using these in our scenario. They travel around in air cars. I'll show you how that works a little bit too. So this is the type of thing, I mean, some people might call that Chrome, but this really is the game. I mean, this is a sci-fi game and the nature of the equipment and the nature of the action and activity is based all in this. Further scenarios into the game give you things such as retrieval cars and retrieval boats and rocket beacons that are sent down to the surface of the planet to wait for the mobile infantry to extract themselves when they're done and per the novel itself and per even what is stated on the back of the box from Heinlein that I read earlier in the video, it's very important not to leave men behind. Now in the rules, this comes in only in scenario five. In the way I'm playing the kind of hybrid scenario, this is one of the mechanisms I am picking up and putting into my early scenario with a retrieval boat coming in toward the end of the game because that makes conceptual sense to me um, having read the book and certainly knowing the importance of retrieval for the game. There are also nuclear devices that can be in use and there are many, 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 I got to show you the radiation counters because I think they're so funny. They look like toast um, and that's probably intentional. Um, these are the radiation counters. I am not using this uh, and in fact I've never really, well that's an unfortunate uh, situation. I've never really used this when I play, but these are radiation counters that um, come into play to indicate certain hexes that are impassable due to radiation. This is later development in later scenarios of the game. And there's, in addition, combat in tunnels that happens. I don't use this either, um, and we'll talk about when I get into the scenario setup how I do the tunneling and sort of how it works solo to have this underground. But I'm not doing combat in tunnels solo. I don't really think it is worth the effort to try to get that to work for you. And the back of the rule book has a helpful chart of what the special weapons and equipment are and it goes over the the name of it and the type of unit that can carry it because not everybody can carry everything the maximum number of this special weapons that can be carried by a unit the maximum number of times it can be used its attack strength, its range, its special effects, and any restrictions on it. This is really helpful. It would be great if it was on a separate card. It is not, but uh, you find yourself referring to this a lot, and I probably should actually just Xerox it because it's in the back of the rules. The only card that you do get with the game is the terrain chart we'll look at when we look at the maps. Your very, very basic CRT, and 
you can see here that this is a not a complex game at all in terms of the CRT. There are very few odds ratios. The, the rules are silent on whether you round up or down, for example, when coming up with a ratio of, say, 1.5 rather than 2 to 1, whether you're rounding up or down. And you just have to make a house rule on that and be consistent in how you do it. And it gets down to this also, you know, you get a total miss. There is disruption or elimination. It's pretty stark in terms of that. And uh, you have two different sides depending on who is attacking and who is defending. And the special weapons that you're carrying are going to be impacted uh, by damage. So this, this makes conceptual sense. It's a little uh, more variance than is usual in the game, but it's good so that when you do sustain damage, you do a die roll, and based on that die roll, uh, you may be losing some of your equipment. So that is useful, and there are restrictions on how many things can be carried and by whom. So you have that listing here. One uh, variant rule that I do use comes in, it's, it's one of the official variant rules, but I don't see really why it should be a variant rule. In any event, this gives a little more complexity to the damage suffered so that per the original rules, you can continue to say get, um, you know, heavy experience, heavy um, damage, and here's the explanation of what what that actually means, but you can be heavily damaged, you know, repeatedly and just kind of stay in that state. That doesn't make conceptual sense. So the Avalon Hill themselves and the basic rules have provided this little mapping here, which makes sense. If you're heavily damaged and you get more heavily damaged, you know, eventually you become wounded. And if you're wounded and wounded, eventually you become killed. And that does seem to make sense. That's not in the basic rules, but that's an optional rule that I absolutely do use. We will take a look at the map in a moment, but I did want to mention the scale of the map is one mile per hex, and the scale of the game itself is about, I think they said 12 minutes per turn. That's somewhere. I can't find it now, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. We're playing a 12-turn game in generally based on scenario one, although I got to tell you, I pick and choose among the rules and the game mechanics that I want in my scenario. So it really is a hybrid because in scenario one, we're only, we would only be playing the Turan, that's the blue, against the humanoids. But I'm bringing in the arachnids because we're going to use this concept of the bugs coming out from underneath the surface of the map, of the surface of the planet, to infiltrate and defend and cause wreak havoc basically on us. So that is part of my game and that is not in scenario one. Additionally, I'm bringing in the special weapons. Now at the back of the map, or excuse me, the rule book itself has some additional addenda to certain scenarios. So I am basing my use on of the special weapons on what is stated here. So you can add to the available forces some rocket launchers and they give you the quantity here and the humanoids get some heavy weapon beams and missiles. We'll see that in use here. You also can use a drop procedure to drop into the planet and if you're familiar with the book you will uh, recognize immediately what that means and we will talk about that. And the uh, victory conditions here are to destroy these critical installation counters. These are represented in the game by the inverted counters and they have the capacity, there's power, communications, and water in existing on the planet and you are meant to destroy these in addition to attaining more victory points than the other player and you get victory points per the scenario rules and um, for either heavy damage or killed in action, as well as elimination. Something that is useful and interesting and complicating in a good way in the game is that if a worker a unit is eliminated, you lose a point. So you can't simply just go in and try to destroy everything. You have to be mindful of the fact that 
destruction of innocent workers who have actually no offensive value is going to cost you. And when you're playing the other side, indeed, you need to position those workers to sacrifice themselves, as we'll see is going to happen, uh, to cause some reduction in the victory conditions of the Turan player. That becomes part of what the quote-unquote AI that you're managing is that is part of their strategy is to sacrifice their workers because of this thing right here. You are keeping track of which of your men has what equipment in using this control sheet that comes with the game. And I mentioned earlier, I showed you a blank one. Here it is filled out. So I am indeed using squad A and squad D. I have indications of who is here, what they're carrying. Some, you, you know, it's like this, um, this heavy equipment here has an unlimited usage, so it's just kind of a black bar, but some of them have a maximum usage of, say, four, so you need to circle it when you're using, you know, however you decide to keep track of it. So there's a teeny bit of keeping track of things, and down here I'm also using the combat engineers and their air cars, which are not part of the official first scenario, and they are carrying equipment that have six usages each, so um, I sort of mark it off that way. And depending on how long the scenario is, you can use this to keep track of your turn record. So this is an important sheet. It's not a lot of bookkeeping, but it is necessary in the game. It's actually pretty easy to get some random setup going here. The first thing you want to do is to divide up the boards, which are mounted maps, Avalon Hill of the time mounted maps, and they fall pretty neatly into six sections without being too accurate about the borders. You can roughly divide it up this way, and then with a D6, when you need to find a sector or an area of the map, you can randomly do that. Similarly, within each of your six areas with two D20, you can find the placement of a particular hex for something. It doesn't match up exactly to 20 by 20, but it's close enough. So you can figure that out. And um, based on that pretty simple system, you can get random placement of things. Now, what I've done here in the opening setup, this is following basically scenario number one, is to place the hidden targets, and these are part of the victory conditions that we'll get to, in an inverted position. The game comes with some counters that have the backs masked as such, and some of these are decoys, and some of them are actual targets, and it comes this way for the two-player game, and you can certainly make a use of it very effectively for the single player game. So I just place these uh, myself based on some instructions in the scenario about how far these were meant to be from the city area, which you can see there in the upper right. And then what I did for the um, the Turan random placement was I rolled for my sectors and I placed my units that was coming in with two separate squads and I placed them following the rules for um, dropping in and scattering that we will get to and that's how I ended up with the placement for the scenario that I'm playing, which is randomized for the aliens and uh, determined based on rules for the Turan side that I'm playing. One of the neat things about the game and additional three-dimensionality aside from the entire underground situation is that the MI units come in via a um, drop mechanic. And so they drop down into the game and then they're scattered according to, there is a drift diagram here. It's basic D6 kind of roll that tells you the direction of the launch that they were meant to be after you've lined them up and then you're rolling on a D6 to determine how far they have actually drifted from where their intended landing spot was. So it's kind of, um, it only happens at the beginning of the the game when you enter in, but it gives some cinematic feel to the game, I guess you could call it that, and that is how they get there. The next 
dimensionality of this game is the underground one and this has to do with these bugs that live underground in the tunnels that we took a look at and the one wonders well how can you play this game solo how could you possibly do that when half of the other player is basically having an entire hidden movement. And oddly, it works pretty well. Now, at the time the game was published, or shortly thereafter, in the general, there was what has become more or less the official solo variant that was written and published as something called Alone Against the Bugs by Rick Matthews. And it is a whole system for uh, mapping the um, underground uh, creation and movement of the tunnels and how you can, in essence, play by yourself with um, a bunch of die rolls to create these underground tunnels and how they work and, for the most part, mimic the two-player version of the game. I have decided I've played that for a few turns and it just, it was onerous to me. So I tried to think to myself, well, what really is the essence of the fact that there are bugs living underneath? And to me, the essence of it is the fact that there are, there, the presence of the mobile infantry uh, awakens them. They can breach the surface, and here are here's a breach marker. And basically, they crawl out. You know, just like ants out of an anthill or what have you. They're crawling out onto the surface. They are um, of limited intelligence. Let's put it that way. And you can pretty easily just dictate their movement when they come out by using a basic, um, there's a scatter diagram here actually, I mean you don't even need this obviously on the map for some effects, um, but, but just with a d6 roll as to first of all how many are coming out at any given breach and where they're going and they move to their maximum movement allowance so you're rolling, you know, if you roll a 1 and this guy's coming out, he's got a movement of 1 if you roll a 1 and this guy's coming out he's got a movement of 3 and you're just going Going around. So this is how I have abstracted the fact of this underground movement. It isn't quite as detailed, or it isn't as detailed at all, but to me it provided enough of the flavor of the game and the concept that there are more and more bugs coming out. Now the question then becomes, well, why would you, if you're playing by yourself, you know, why would you actively cause a breach or seek out a breach? And the what I've done here in the original rules, the MI in, uh, mobile infantry has these listening devices that they can use to try to find and seek out the tunnels. And then there are um, mechanisms for going in the tunnels. And this is basically how you're playing the game because the other player is pretty much mostly underground. Here, it's different. Here, the listening device is changed into basically the fact that when you're landing on this planet to do your objectives, and in this case, the objectives uh, primarily primarily are concerning these inverted counters here. You see one here to try to uncover the communications and power and water and occupy them, that while you're doing that, you are disturbing the bugs. And therefore, it is basically mandatory to do, in essence, it's almost like, um, you know, if you've played a dungeon crawler and you have to do a wandering monster check to go into a room, that when you are entering segments and at the beginning of the first four turns of anybody's movement, they have to do a die roll to see whether they are disturbing the bugs and causing a breach. And you can adjust the difficulty level of your game based on what percentage chance you want to give yourself to discover. You could make it a 20% chance, you could make it a 30% chance, obviously you could make it higher. But every time a breach is discovered, a certain amount of bugs are going to be potentially coming out. And I use the rules, I set up my little hives, and I use the rules that are provided in the game for what lives in a hive, how many workers, how many warriors, and how many um, heavy equipment. And then based on a d6 roll, as I mentioned earlier, when a breach is found, they will come out and eventually start moving and fighting you. This is in addition to whoever else is already here fighting you. So that is how that mechanic works. And oddly, as I said, that even though you would think it would be rather difficult to solo a game with so much hidden information, when you abstract it in this way, it works pretty easily.
my solo sequence of play is very closely based on the official sequence of play, but I'll just walk you through it here. It's a little bit different. I go first. And the first thing I get to do is to, well, again, this is mandatory use of the listening device for everybody for the first four turns of the game, meaning, uh, again, the listening device here is essentially representing you causing the arachnids to recognize that you're there and you are rolling on a percentage. Again, it would be 20 or 30 percent chance, depending on how difficult you want to make it, that you would be heard. And then if you were heard, there um, is a basic D6 movement that I have or not really movement, but location that I have worked out using a D6 and a D10 to give a range and a plotting of where the actual breach will be. So it's not going to necessarily be, or it won't be in the hex that you're in. It's going to be anywhere within a range if indeed you find something or you are discovered. Then um, the next thing that comes in are uh, combat engineers. These are the special people who can seal off and also destroy inside a breach. And per the regular rules of the game, they cannot do this in the same turn that they move to a breach. So you need to um, engineer that as it were. If um, you discover a breach and you're going to try to set somebody up to seal it off, it's going to take a couple of turns. In the meantime, when you do have that breach discovered, as we talked about, you're rolling a one to six for who's coming out, and then you're rolling for movement for each. And I already showed you what that looks like on the map. After that, you can move any, all, or none of your other units. You then conduct range combat, uh, which happens with any ranged weapon that you have. And typical ranges are, you know, six to nine hexes away. Then you're doing close combat, which is when you're in the same hex of somebody. <laughs> And there, finally, there's this extended jump um, mechanism. This comes from the book, and I don't know really how well it works as a game effect, but I do use it because it's pretty key to the book, which is essentially at the end of something, at the very end of your turn, you can jump away. You can only do it using half your movement value. You can't do it if you're um, heavily wounded, and these engineers can't jump away either. They're in air cars, and the air cars don't jump, but the rest of you can move. So if you've got a movement value of six, you can kind of hop away three hexes um, after you do something if you want. And uh, it's, it's a benefit to you. I won't deny it. But um, it also is not always possible to make use of it because you could be hopping into a worse situation. The second part of the turn are the aliens going. And um, I have them going last, but there's really just two. It's like first and second. The um, I mentioned that workers do not have, arachnid workers have no offensive combat value, and they are basically just there to cause you to lose victory points if they get in your way, and they will move to cover if they can, and cover in this case means moving into a hex with a warrior. So when they have come out of their hive, uh, the first thing they will do on their turn is to try to get into a hex with a warrior, which of course makes it more likely that they'll be destroyed if the warrior engages in combat, but also will protect them if they are successful in combat. Then the aliens will use their range or the, yeah, well, the aliens will use their ranged weapons to attack. They will continue to move and then they will continue to do close combat. The Attack or movement priority, you know, you are in essence, you know, doing a two player thing here where you have to come up with some sort of priority for the aliens. I have taken this priority listing directly from and following this, what I mentioned earlier to this uh, Alone Against the Bugs solitaire variant, which comes with, um, this is listed as a beam fire priority. Again, these rules are a little bit different, but um, this is um, a fire priority that's given in these rules, and I have picked up the relevant um, uh, indications here. We're not the humanoid installation, for example, is out in terms of our rules, but I have picked up the rest of the priorities here for where the aliens would attack if they're given a choice. 
There's also the suggestion that they could have more strategies here in terms of figuring out whether they're going for the highest odds or the largest number of targets. And if all else is equal after this, sometimes I roll on this, but honestly, I don't end up using this terribly much, but it's here on my card just as a reminder if I'm sort of unsure about what would be um, implemented on behalf of the AI, I'll take a look at that. One of my rules and desires when I'm playing something solo is to not really spend too much time thinking about what the AI is going to do. I, I want it to be pretty clear, and I also don't want to spend most of my time in the game executing that. So for that reason, I do have this here where I can just quickly look at it. I'm not spending a whole lot of my mental energy figuring out the strategy for the other side, because that becomes a little less interesting to me if I have to do it for too much of my game time. We're taking a look here at the map. We're just two turns in, but already a lot is going on, and it's a good opportunity to show you a little bit of how the game functions and on what various levels we can see things, activity happening. We are showing here the breach marker for a tunnel that was discovered, and it's in the second cycle of the arachnids coming out, and we've got one of um, the heavy weapons had come out. So this is here with a range of six, and it's got a firepower of 18, and I believe we are, we couldn't get out of range of it, so uh, somebody's going to get hit by this pretty badly in the next turn. And we have off map also, there was another breach that happened. Up here in the city, there was a third breach, but we only have a, a lowly uh, worker that came out represented right here. Now, you may recall that the victory conditions are such that if you are destroying workers, you are losing victory points. And this is an interesting and complicating mechanic of the game because what happens is that the workers in certain situations like right here, where you can see that we have a bunch of MI stacked here. This was a revealed communications tower. You can't see underneath there, but it's a revealed communications tower. We need to remain in occupancy of this tower for a full turn in order to get the seven victory victory points that it will entitle us to. The problem is that as the turn goes, the workers are going to come and occupy it and basically sacrifice themselves to uh, the cause, and we will be losing victory points if slash when we need to dispose of them in order to get the seven. So the more that happens, you know, it's a push and pull between losing victory points for workers killed and gaining victory points for the successful occupation of that particular Hex. I've spent a lot of time discussing the game in general terms and trying to show how it can be effectively played solo and no actual gameplay and I see the length of this video is going to probably preclude that. I don't think this is a very complicated game for certainly anyone who is a war gamer of any type of complexity beyond the very, very most basic. This is not a complicated game, and showing gameplay probably isn't going to give you much more than I've already done right now in terms of explaining how the game might work and trying to figure out whether it's a game that you would want to get or maybe get out again to try to play solo the way I have. The foundational rules of the game, the basic structure and the mathematical representation of the odds and all of that are quite simple and clear, and the uh, rules on top of that um, that give the scenarios their variance and that give the game its flavor are really able to be tweaked enough. They're pretty flexible. The goals of the various scenarios are clear and differentiated. And again, I have found it possible to pick up and choose among some of the rules and basically place them into the structure of a um, scenario. And it works perfectly fine for 
for me. The other thing that um, I'm just showing you here, the other thing that is really great about this game, if you're so inclined, as I have been, is to seek out a lot of material was published in the general, relatively contemporaneous to the game. There is this great essay on the various counters and talking about strategy. Now, of course, all of this is in the context of the two-player game as it was desi designed to be, but it's still interesting if you like the game. And there there are also a number of other scenarios that have been published, and you can take, if you so choose, as I have done from time to time, um, some suggestions for gameplay from the scenarios and things that you could add in or try to figure out for yourself. I have made up and used these recruit counters. I quite like this. Um, this suggestion here, this is from something called Saga of the... Bug War by Richard Hamblin, and it provides a mechanism whereby when you lose some men, you can bring in recruits, and these are the recruit counters, and you basically do a roll on a d10 to give the combat value, so it's kind of like the concept is that, you know, you don't know whether you're going to get a recruit who's going to be fantastic or terrible, and uh, based on that roll, you're kind of stuck with your recruits for the rest of the game, but at least you're getting in new players, and these come in by way of those, um, the drop mechanism. I think it's the drop mechanism. I can't really remember. It's been a while since I've played this, but this is, I like this. And, you know, you have to make up your own counters, but um, you've got all the examples right here. In the book, there are these neo-dogs, and there is an explanation in the original rules as to why they were dropped in the designer's notes, why they were dropped from the game. Essentially, they don't add very much, but it is a kind of nice little piece of chrome to have this concept that you've got some dogs with you. They can't, uh, they don't have any offensive capability and then they just die and it's kind of sad, but you can um, certainly add that in. So I have made up these counters from here and I quite like it. Um, here's my extra copy of the rules and there's also something else I've got here. Something in the dragon that came out. I don't, this is another variant. I don't actually know whether I've ever looked at this, to be honest with you. I don't think I have, but that exists. And there was another, in addition to the one that I showed you, uh, there was another solo variant published, and this also came from the general, and it is, uh, it's, this way of taking, it's a good idea, I mean, I would never do it, but it's a way of basically taking a five blank pieces of, uh, or five blank reproductions of the, um, the alien control pad and making up your own, um, tunnel complexes, you know, according to the rules of the game, and then just kind of randomly choosing one and cutting out these circles. Um, it's kind of a cute idea, but it's very little crafty, I guess. I just, it's hard to imagine how it would actually work, but you're supposed to draw the tunnel complexes five or more, and then, you know, turn the sheets over so you don't know what you're getting, or maybe you do that, you know, two weeks in advance or something, and then slowly, like, cut these circles out to see whether you've you know, discovered part of a tunnel. It, it's a cute idea. I mean, I can't imagine that it would actually work because I think the paper would become so damaged by the end, but it's an interesting idea. And um, some more scenarios that come in that were published in the general. There's a dis an expansion here scenario, search and destroy with some new counters. So there's material available. Um, and finally, there's another um, expansion that was published by one of the playtesters for the game and some discussion about what he would have done differently had he been actually the person designing it as opposed to the playtester. So um, it, it's nice to have this material. It's kind of like having what we have now online available to us from everybody, but the back in the day before there was online, there was the general and these other magazines that provided this type of content. So um, if you're interested in this game, you, you do have the possibility of having some additional material out there for you to try to pick and choose from. And um, here's an example in the rules of how they fill out that um, Turan control sheet or uh, whatever it's called for the players.
And overall, I think it is very soloable as a, um, even though it's a two-player game, using the way that um, I do it, I think reduces the amount of time you spend dealing with the other side, whereas the published solo scenario, it does try to model more completely the nature of the two-player game, and as a result, you spend a lot of time rolling the dice. So there you have it. These are my thoughts and uh, appreciation of Starship Troopers. Thanks for watching.